Hello, and welcome again to the Writers' Roundtable. This time, we hear a selection from the creative outlet Portland.org's Monograph Magazine. This is an entry from Wichita Drive, a nonfiction diary written during Patrick Howard's 1979 experience as a student teacher. While the details and circumstances described are all true, out of respect for all the relationships made during this time, names and locations have been changed. Stay tuned. Wichita Drive Elementary, A Journal, 1979. In 1979, as an education student in Northridge, California, I was assigned to apprentice at two vastly different elementary schools, one in a middle-class neighborhood in the North San Fernando Valley, the other a working-class school in nearby Newhall in the Santa Clarita Valley. What follows is a journal of my experiences. Day 1. My first experience upon arriving at Wichita Drive School is an outdoor assembly. It really feels like an old-fashioned pep rally. The topic today is Conservation Week. Each room has sent a representative who, in turn, holds up a hand-rendered placard with a conservation slogan like, Don't waste paper. Don't waste food. Save wild animals. Don't pollute the water. And don't pollute the air. The kids are also going to plant a tree for Arbor Day. A bottle brush. After the festivities, the principal, Mr. Parrish, calls up the recent winners for the Spirit Badge Awards from each room. Really a lot of kids won Spirit Badges. Quite a feat considering that to win a badge you had to earn 10, 10 Spirit Certificates. Some of the kids win their fifth badge today. All this amidst team spirit and enthusiastic yelling directed by the principal. Tell the neighborhood what we are at Wichita Drive. Knowing that the kids' voices will carry across the playground, bounce off the buildings, and through the streets surrounding the school. We're number one, is the well-known reply, in a multitude of high-pitched shrieks. My assignment at Wichita Drive is in the combined kindergarten first grade class of Mrs. Percy and her aide, Mrs. Rothko. There are approximately 20 kids in the first grade class and 8 in kindergarten. I wander around looking at the room. There is a black history unit in progress. There is a reading lesson and a 3D display called the Africa Book that includes a ceremonial mask, a hut, an elephant, a drum, and other jungle icons. Posters of famous black people have been hung up on the walls. Muhammad Ali, Stevie Wonder, Martin Luther King and Coretta Scott King, Cicely Tyson, Sidney Poitier, Jesse Jackson, Bill Cosby, Alex Haley, Richard Pryor, O.J. Simpson, Barbara Jordan, and various nameless football and basketball players. Also a placard that reads, Many black people live in the United States. Their ancestors came from Africa. There is also a quote from Ralph Bunch and a rhyme about how he learned the value of education and what he did as delegate to the United Nations. This is there for the children to copy as a handwriting exercise. The whole unit is there according to Mrs. Percy because five of her children, quote, come on the bus. It seems the driving force for the school can be summed up in one phrase, positive mental attitude, positive self-image. The whole place is jumping with, I'm great, you're great, everybody's great. The pep rally is just one example. Teachers wear, I've got the spirit badges, and the kids are called friend, sweetheart, sweetie pie. It's like one big learning party. I cannot help to compare this situation with what I'm observing in Mrs. Wright's class at Newhall School. In Mrs. Wright's class, all decisions are made for the children by the teachers. No self-reliance is developed. The children are instructed to toe the line and are made to feel that they are bad if they don't. They are constantly admonished for minor breaches of conduct. By contrast, in Mrs. Percy's class, children are allowed to work independently with lots of encouragement. This is not a typical open classroom, she is quick to point out. 
it's still a structured environment, but to me it's more loosely structured compared to the only other experience I've had, that of Mrs. Wright's class, which feels like a child prison. For the next unit, Mrs. Percy takes one small group herself. Her aide sits on the floor with the second group, and the third group works independently with intermittent supervision. The children are given a chance to mess around and talk to one another. At first, Mrs. Percy has to remind them to quiet down and to get to work. To my surprise, they start working immediately and have completed their assignment. The children are self-motivated towards doing a good job and a complete job through an element of self-reward supplemented by comments from the teacher, like, think of when you will have to turn this in and you don't have it done yet, and you'll need to rush to get it finished. I want to ask if the children are all as rowdy as they are today. I suspect not, as there is a newcomer, me, in the room this day, but they certainly are allowed to talk amongst themselves like normal people would while working together on an assignment. They can worm around and are not forced to sit in their seats. When finished with the assignment, they can walk around the room and go to the bathroom independently without having to ask permission. Again, Mrs. Percy lavishly dishes out praise. She actually touches the children. Later, I saw children touching each other and me, lovingly and with familiarity. They are allowed to call out during the lesson, within reason, if they know the answer. The teacher uses long adult words unselfconsciously like mystified, passenger liner, Caribbean, backgammon, and particularly. She makes sure to ask everyone in the group to answer. She maintains order and attention well. The loose atmosphere does not seem to diminish the respect the kids have for her. All the above is supported by the bright and fresh atmosphere of the classroom itself. Much of the activity takes place outside in the patio. The whole scene is open and cheery. Mrs. Percy has a personality to match. She praises the kids who remember to bring their parents' signed slips back to class. Those who forget are told, Who was supposed to get them signed? Don't blame it on your mother or father. It's your responsibility. This is the high-level message to a room of five- and six-year-olds. She gives them the choice of the game they will play at lunch break, which allows still more choice-making and independence. When children get competitive and compare their work to their neighbors, her comment is, don't mind what your neighbor is doing, pay attention to doing a good job on your own work. More positive self-attitude, more independence, and a good way to handle criticism and bullying among class members. I next observe children at the metric board a pegboard of actual glass and plastic containers attached to it indicating certain measures, one quart, one gallon, one liter, plus a foot, a yard, and a meter rule. A really good way to learn the metric system. If they grow up with a facility for both systems and know the conversions and relationships of the different measures, it will become second nature to them versus adults who have been slow and unwilling to change over to the European system. Plus, the metric board is really cute and visually dynamic, with all those bottles, buckets, and rulers stuck up on the board. Another fun activity on a different board is the matching game, where you have patterns on the left and you match them with one of several choices on the right. This is good for learning left-to-right eye movement coordination as a reading readiness skill. Later, Mrs. Percy tells me a story of two of her kids that served to underscore the importance of parents' cooperation in the education process and the extreme detrimental effect of lack of parental involvement. Her belief, which I share, is that so much learning and preparedness for school goes on in the home before the child even enters school. She values parents just simply talking to children, taking them places, explaining things to them, spending time with them and finding out what they are experiencing. She has not found a strong relationship between children that go to preschool or an early childhood education program and one that does particularly well in school. The quality of the program is more important than simply having attended a program. Some kids do great with it, some do fair or even poorly. But she again emphasizes the home influence. Her kids that come on the bus 
do not get the kind of parental involvement that the general population of the school gets. That is, white upper middle class kids from around the neighborhood. She also notes the transience of those living in apartments, especially the Pepper Tree area, who live there sometimes for just a matter of weeks or months. According to her, the child in this case enjoys no stability. I counter that this factor or coming from a so-called broken home does not necessarily lead to poor school performance, and we agree that such an upbringing may actually encourage the child to become more independent and develop self-motivation and self-assurance in life's endeavors, rather than leaning so much on parents for guidance and support. The problem is, she says, that you might get a person that is not as trusting and warm as he otherwise might be. Case number one, Francesca. Mrs. Percy describes Francesca as a real space case. Her view of reality is often way out in left field. She shows some difficulty in communication and has a faulty sense of personal space and spatial relationships. She often runs into other children, causing other difficulties to arise later. Her mother is a barmaid, divorced and remarried. The mother and stepfather don't seem to communicate with Francesca. The girl didn't even know that her new stepfather was Ted, or who her father is at all. Besides Francesca, there are two teenage children in the house, a boy and a girl, by the stepfather from another marriage, who taunt her incessantly, which does not help her situation. Mrs. Percy has spoken to the mother twice, but nothing has changed. Case number two, Brian. Brian comes to school unkempt, often enough for her to think he is bathing infrequently and getting himself ready in the morning, or his older sister in the third grade is doing it for him. Both mother and stepfather came to the present marriage with two or three kids. Both of them work, the father is on the road a lot, and neither parent can spend much time with Brian or the other kids. They cannot really be blamed for hindering Brian's learning or damaging his development, they're just barely holding it together, trying to make ends meet. In either case, the two children do not get the attention they need at home, especially with learning basic conceptual skills that school-age children require for readiness to move along Piaget's stages of development. I believe Mrs. Percy's concern is genuine, which is heartening. Join us again for another edition of the Writer's Roundtable. The Writer's Roundtable is a project of the creative outlet Portland.org.